Hello and welcome back everybody. Uh, my name is Tiki Fullerton. I'm the ABC's business presenter, but a couple of generations ago I also presented Landline. And so I'm a very passionate uh, uh, rural business uh, person. Um, it's my delight to present this really, really important plenary session. Uh, you will have heard the speeches this morning, including that uh, quite passionate call to arms from our Deputy Prime Minister, and uh, dare I say that you know Barnaby is right, but it is a big question why we've got two trillion dollars worth of funds sloshing around in Australia, and so little of them uh, in invested in agriculture and agri-food, which is, I think, one of the new buzzwords. Um, and uh, so the object of uh, the this morning's session, investing in agriculture, is to come to grips with some of the reasons for that and how we can change that. Uh, we've had lots of speeches, as, as I've said. We're not going to have any more speeches in this session. We're going to have an hour and a half of uh, discussion. Uh, at uh, some point, I think about uh, 45 minutes, an hour in, I'm actually going to throw to the floor. Uh, forgive us, because it's actually quite hard to see you out there. So if you wouldn't mind coming down to, uh, to, to, the, the, uh, to, to the speakers, if you get selected, um, and uh, state your name and where you're from, and uh, be delighted to have conversation. Um, I'm going to encourage panelists they don't need any encouragement, actually, to jump in on each other and have a bit of a conversation. Um, in fact, one of them's already offered to take over as the moderator. So obviously, there's a great, great deal of passion here. Um, and I can remember uh, just 15 years ago going up the New England Highway and seeing, you know, places like Togo Station and you know all this, all this, all this country owned by AMP and National Mutual, and then it was all, all, all sold off. And notwithstanding this great transitional economy that we're supposed to have, and agriculture being the pillar, um, there seems to be a missing link here. So let me go to our panel. Uh, on my far left, Elizabeth O'Leary. Uh, now, fabulous to have Liz, uh, because she is actually from the land uh, to Pitt Street, I think, so still some shit on your boots. Um, uh, Liz is a senior managing director at Macquarie Group uh, with more than 12 years uh, experience in business in Australia, the UK and Hong Kong. She's the head of agriculture for Macquarie Infrastructure and Real Assets, Mira. Uh, Mira Agriculture manages two wholesale funds on behalf of its investors with assets in Australia and Brazil. She's a very active director on the boards of the funds operating companies, which are Paraguay Pastoral, Lawson's Grains, and Cruzeiro do Sol Graos Limitada, which is my best Portuguese. <laughs> uh, she's had a lot of other roles at McBank, including in London, but more importantly, uh, Liz, you were raised uh, on a rice, wheat, and sheep farm in the Riverina, a decade experience as an active investor in one of Australia's largest Angus cattle breeding companies, and you're an owner operator of farmland in three Aussie states so some skin in the game. Uh, moving to John, uh, John Corbett of Hassad Australia. Uh, John's an independent consultant with 30 years experience in arranging and structuring capital and business solutions for corporate, uh, multinational agriculture and agribusiness clients. A big career uh, before that at ANZ where uh, he led the New South Wales corporate cotton agriculture portfolio which covered uh, producers, ginning, marketing, cotton and dairy co-ops, etc., uh, and grain processing. Uh, he also led ANZ's Queensland corporate banking portfolio. Today, though, John is a director of Hassad, a large-scale uh, cropping and livestock entity wholly owned by the Qatar Investment Authority, operating across Australia. Now it gets interesting. He's also a director of Australian Grain Champions, which is pushing to take over and commercialise the uh, grain co-op CBH in the West which I know is a very hot topic. Uh, John formed AGC with former CBH directors and a number of WA grain growers, so more on that a little later. Uh, Damien, to my right, who shouldn't feel in any way defensive today, <laughs> joined First State Super uh, in, in January 2014 as the head of income and real assets, which includes uh, fixed income, credit infrastructure, and property. And I should, should add, um, First State Super uh, it started life as basically the largest de default super fund. And I'll get you to explain who your members are a, a, a little bit later. But um, Damien previously spent 11 years at uh, Perpetual Investments, where he became head of multi-manager uh, multi funds. And prior to that, uh, was at ING Optimics, uh, working in 
investment management, and again in the multi-manager group looking at tactical asset allocation. Uh, he's also talked to the AFR already this morning, the cheeky bugger. Uh, and finally, David Watson over on my right uh, from Austrade. Uh, David was appointed uh, by the great Andrew Robb, Minister for Trade and Investment, as his senior investment specialist for the agribusiness and food sector with Austrade uh, in July 2014. Uh, obviously an experienced food industry executive, having worked in senior roles at Mars around the world, uh, including in Dubai, where he covered Africa, India, and the Middle East, and more recently in uh, the head office in Washington where he was a member of the management team responsible for the chocolate division globally, all of which gave him a great understanding of the investment drivers for a global food company and a lot of free chocolate. So uh, to, 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 uh, to the first question, let me kick off with a really basic one to David. Why is it so hard to invest in our future in this country, in agriculture? I don't think I can answer that question without talking about the Australian super funds, um, because that very quickly um, gets to uh, why they not, are not investing. And of course, Damien will have uh, far more um, detailed uh, response than me. From the investors that I talk to, and I've, I've spoken to many of the Australian super funds, um, I, I think there is a structural issue. Um, and what I mean by that is that uh, with portability in Australia and the shift from defined benefits schemes to principally accumulation funds where um, members can move their money very quickly, it essentially becomes like a bank account um, and managers are measured like stocks um, on, on the ASX uh, in terms of performance. It, it drives a, a very short-term view of uh, performance. And so uh, with portability and, and uh, managers' fears of, of being judged financially uh, on very short time frames, um, that, that structure of the industry I don't think necessarily lends itself well to the sector. But, um, but people talk about volatility, though. I mean, you look at the alternative, one of the alternative asset classes, which is equities at the moment. Isn't that a little bit ironic? I mean, we're talking about volatility in the agricultural sector. And look at the stock market. Uh, yes, it is ironic. Yet, I, I think the other part of the equation is talking about volatility and performance is there is a history of, um, particularly through managed investment schemes, where superannuation funds in the past have, have invested that have not performed well. So there is, I think, some perhaps not only lack of understanding of the sector, but also fear of the sector given some funds that have... Um, that have uh, been burnt um, by investing in the sector in the past, and I think that's still apparent to, to many uh, super fund managers. Um, but, you know, I, I actually am looking to Damien as our proxy for the superannuation industry sure. here um, for, for his response, but can I actually put in a question of my own to, to Damien um, to answer Tiki's question? And, and uh, because I'm actually wondering to what extent, to what extent does it make a difference um, in the answer between an industry fund and a retail fund. So would it be correct to say industry funds are, again, structured in a way that allows a longer-term investment horizon to be um, considered as opposed to a, a retail fund? Yeah, I mean, thank you for that. So look, that's uh, another fault line all, all in of itself. So I'll address a few things in turn. So I think to sum up your, your, your questions, it, it's really around how much illiquidity uh, can a super fund take? Um, because as you pointed out, um, a public offer fund like First State Super is, uh, on any given day, uh, our 750,000 members could turn up and say we want all of our money back tomorrow. Now, of course, that's unlikely, uh, and we've been through the global financial crisis and that didn't happen. So we can have some confidence to have a level of illiquidity in our portfolios. And by that, I mean uh, private assets that we can't necessarily sell within one year, give or take. We at First at Super are underinvested in alternatives. We've got about 11% uh, in, in the liquid asset classes, so we've got appetite to be investing in more, and hence why I'm here today. We are investing in agriculture, but I'll, I'll get to that. Mm. Um, the, on average, we feel about 20 to 30% in so-called illiquid investments when your public offer fund is, is about right, is about fair. Um, and some of our peers are, are around sort of 30 to 40%, Aussie Super. Host Plus and others are at the upper end of that. Um, who so, yeah. is your membership, though, Damien? And, and does that impact on your decision-making? 
Look, absolutely, absolutely. So, so again, taking a broader step back, um, so, so to, to some of the points that were raised earlier, the, the Australian economy, uh, the GDP of the Australian economy, uh, I think is circa $1.5 trillion. Uh, the Australian super industry itself is about $2 trillion, so about a 1.3 ratio, so it's big. Uh, in another 10 years, based on some fairly basic assumptions, super will be 10 times the size, also five times the size, I should say, of, of GDP. So the key thing for us, and one of, the, one of the sort of eight things we look at when we look at any investment, is this concept around universal ownership. And what that means is that what is going to make the biggest impact for our members in their retirement in 15 or 20 years, because the average member is in their 40s, um, will actually be on the relative productivity of the Australian ecosystem and the environment. So what we like to do is to invest in things across all asset classes, be it vulture, uh, venture capital, be it agriculture, be it construction, it actually leads to sort of productivity and multiply gains across the whole economy so, itself. So tell me about the model, you, tell me about almonds, tell me about the model that you, you've put out there, because that was quite a big lick of it, an investment, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, so, and again, just, just to, as a, to, to, in terms of the almond uh, ideal, I'll explain that in a second, but I think also in terms of why super and, and why now, I hope is the question, as opposed to why not in the past, but why now. Um, Again, we have a broad range of things we can invest in, be it infrastructure, be it real estate, uh, be it agriculture. Uh, real estate is a very well-known asset class, very deep, very liquid capital markets. Infrastructure really has come into its own in the last 10 years, but is relatively new, 20, 25 years old. Agriculture, it's starting to, in, in, in our world, in terms of it being an institutional asset class, I think is starting to come into its own as well. So I think that we should need to view all of these developments through time. Um, and again, the superannuation industry has grown up a lot and can now consider doing these investments. In the case of almonds, um, what we want to do is we, we have a range of ways in which we can invest. Our preferred method um, is to invest in areas where we can provide bespoke capital solutions to, group, group, to groups who can use those funds ideally for more uh, productive purposes on their own, on their own farms. We buy the orchards. land. We buy the land and we have a sale and lease back, back to the operator. Yeah. All right. Uh, let me go over to, to Liz, because that's, uh, that's not really your model, is it? Um, how have you, uh, you, you... Macquarie has been so big in infrastructure, it's becoming now much bigger in agriculture as well. What's your investment model? So our existing investment model through our two wholesale funds is actually an owner-operator model. And really, <clears throat> I think that comes, this question comes to the heart of the issue, and that's understanding the investor, the investor need and the investor appetite. And, and actually, I think one of the barriers to greater um, super fund investment in agriculture is we, the sector, um, have not yet evolved sufficiently in terms of nimble product structures that are reflective of um, the, the investor need versus our deep and abiding passion for our operating companies and our businesses. We were just talking before about our, you know, when we package up an investment, um, inevitably folks working in this sector are so deeply passionate about the operations of their business mm. that we can sometimes fall into a trap of losing the investor along the way because it's such unfamiliar territory. So, so is it what, um, who was it, it was women? It was, it was saying um, it was about risk and uncertainty, almost in a sort of Rumsfeld way, that it's, it's almost about your, your, your known and your unknown unknowns. That's, that's, that's oh. right. And so I think there is no, you know, we, we need to be careful not to become fixated on there being a right or a wrong operating model and a right or a wrong investment style here. There will be owner operators and they have a place for those investors seeking exposure to the underlying um, production asset and the commodity, as well as um, you know, a real estate but, but slash really land you favour that model because um, the, 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 the lease model is quite favoured in the US, isn't it? That's why, right. why do you not go for that model as well? Yeah, we favour the owner operator model, particularly in our grains business in Australia. Um, look, partially it's the dynamic of the Australian market. We don't have have um, luxuries such as crop insurance. I'm sure my American friends might call it luxury, but it's a great risk management strategy underwritten by the US government. We don't have those sorts of safety nets. Um, so as a result, there is the, the volatility is very real and not cushioned. And so as a result, we see tenancy risk. Others don't, but we see tenancy risk in core, core broadacre farming in Australia that 
that therefore leads us, in order to manage risk on behalf of investors, leads us to have a preference to be the operator, we also believe we can generate superior returns as an operator, as opposed to a um, as opposed to the tenant landlord model. Right. So, so how do you uh, see what Karen Schneider was saying earlier today about the performance of corporate farms versus the large uh, f um, uh, f grower-owned farmer farmer-owned farms? So, so the the data is interesting. I'm not sure how we actually differentiate between what's a corporate-owned farm um, and what's a large farm. Um, they're not. Um, they're not necessarily um, as linked as many would anticipate. You know, all I can do is look to the businesses I'm responsible for um, and look at their operating returns that are you know, about, to be, um, about to be released. And I think you know, we're, we're, pretty, we're very comfortable with where we are sitting. But I think at the end of the day, as I know, John, you would attest to through your exposure to Hassad, um, this is a long-term investment horizon. You need to be willing to understand and live through the natural volatility in the cycle, mm. um, and also appreciate as an investor how much of that volatility you want to be exposed to. All right, John. Let me ask you about Hassad because they're, a, you know, a Qatari investor, and originally, presumably, it was a food security thing that that drove them uh, to invest in Australia. Is that still the case? So Hassad and a number of other parties, I guess, looked at this, uh, these sorts of investments from a food security perspective. But um, you cannot make these investments work without having it economically based. It's got to actually deliver a rate of return. And so um, whilst you might have a focus on production, um, that production's got to be economically viable. Otherwise, at some stage or rather, it is uh, not, not going to be sustainable as an investment, both from a point of view of um, current production, but also from a long longevity perspective of investing further capital into the business. So um, I think all these models that people look at, um, they have a genesis somewhere. But it's a question of how they evolve, and that, that's come through already on the panel today. I think from an agricultural perspective, we are on the, uh, uh, on the very beginnings of the evolution of the, the investment models that are going to be attractive to institutional capital to come into the sector. The other important thing, I think, in this is also how you then um, align management. In agriculture, uh, people point to volatility, but uh, you can also point to, uh, like any other sector, um, parties who operate very, very well and have made great wealth um, in that sector in a lifetime. Um, so in my career, I've banked farming families who started off with next to nothing and have net worths well in excess of $100 million today after one generation. That's because they are very, very good at what they do. How do you start to capture management in this sector and actually be able to align that back to uh, an investment model? And I think that's one of the, um, the, the key things that we as an industry sector are still grappling with and struggling with. Mm -hmm. And hence, that sort of drop and drives your, um, your operating models about uh, owner-operator um, versus a lease-type uh, model. OK. Now, look, I, I want to ask you, obviously, you are right in the thick of this um, uh, proposal uh, for CBH, but could you maybe give us an insight into your experience over the last 12 months trying to raise this 600 million or so, mm -hmm. and um, w what the response has been from the institutional community? So I think what I've seen is, uh, and has been touched on here, is that uh, different institutions are still working through and understanding the sector. So there's still quite varying um, amounts of uh, knowledge and understanding in the sector, and it's a very immature sector for a lot. Um, it's interesting how, as we went through, so CBH is a business, is uh, largely an asset um, business in terms of the infrastructure of moving grain from up country to port and out. So it's a big asset infrastructure business which has volumetric risk. And it was amazing how often parties that we're talking to want to talk about commodity prices, which had no real bearing to uh, volumetric uh, risk because at the end of the day, if you're a grain farmer and that's your setup, that's what you're set up to do, you'll continue to plant um, each and every year expecting there to be an improvement in prices even if they're not quite as favourable at the beginning of the season. Um, so it's actually the understanding aspects that uh, we, we found that uh, was difficult as we went around talking to institutional capital. And then, of course, overlay with that volatility. So um, 
I guess, again, the misunderstanding about the, the real volatility versus what they read in the paper. Uh, they pick up the front page of the Australian, you know, I have the picture there of the, the drought at Longreach and cattle standing there in a, a field with not a blade of grass, and they equate that to all of Australia agriculture. Um, and just trying to get people to understand how, with modern farming practices, say in, in the grain sector, that volatility is being managed, uh, and indeed how the improvements in farming practices has so greatly improved the ability of the farmer to deal with uh, low water years and greatly increased the productivity on much, le much less um, amounts of uh, rainfall. Yeah. So we, we found that you know, as we went around, we had varying different understandings of the sector and it was a, a long, slow journey to get institutional capital over the line. Okay, so, so Damien, uh, are, are you involved with Grain Champions? Are you involved in this deal? Yes, we are. So what's your, what, what has your journey been and why are you attracted to, to what might be happening? Yeah, well, I mean, it starts from the thesis that, that we have at First State Super that um, when we look across the world, across all asset classes, that um, there is a lot to really like in Australian agriculture. Uh, to, to similar to what John said, um, you know, Australian farmers and growers are, are globally competitive. They're, they're, they're very productive. It's an asset class in which we would like to have more exposure over time. That doesn't, that doesn't address necessarily the implementation and execution challenges of which there are many, um, but our approach uh, in terms of um, our development being a uh, sort of a, a crawl, walk, run style approach to agriculture is, is to approach it more from the credit angle. So for example, what we're doing in, in almonds is a sale and lease back. It's credit analysis of the counterparty. We're also doing some, um, some, some, some water sale and lease backs, again, credit analysis in a lot of ways. Um, we're looking at this when we're approached uh, for this opportunity um, to look at it from a credit angle um, and um, we can do the work on that. We know how to do credit work and um, the, the, the deal stuck, stacks up, assuming the growers want to do it. And Liz, you, you'll be in this if the, if, the, if the growers want it, if the farmers want it? Uh, it's not within mandate for our current, um, our current fund, so unfortunately we won't be participating. But um, it's interesting sitting on the sidelines and just watching um, innovation circle around the sector. But can I pick up on something Damien said about, you know, the, the approach he's taken to evaluating investment opportunities presented to him. And I think, you know, there is, there is a real lesson for us is you strip it right back to something very simple and very fundamental. And, and there is a lesson in that for those asset managers in the room um, attempting to create new product uh, and evolve their existing platforms to take them to market. We need to make the complex simple. Um, and unfortunately, in the sector, I, I still think we've got a way to go in, in articulating our value proposition in an investor's language. And, and so I think that's a, that's a real lesson learned um, for, for folks raising capital, for particularly for development projects. OK, can I, can I also put it out there that it's, it's um, getting the public on side as well, and a lot of these, uh, a lot of these big, big deals. Um, uh, for example, there is a, a, a different side to, the, to, to your deal, uh, which, which are growers, and I, I know the Deputy Prime Minister is not, not in favour of it, um, which is that um, you know, GWA was perfectly all right and uh, grain core should never have happened, and this is going to happen all over again. Now, um, if that flared up, um, Damien, is this something you worry about being on the front page of, you know, a, a, you know in, in terms of political backlash? Yeah, look, I mean, with any of our investments, there's always the front page test of how will this look, how will this feel. Uh, at the end of the day, we're representing 750,000 average Australians, nurses, teachers. Um, they would love to see us do more in, in agriculture. So when we did the almond farm, they, they were thrilled that their money was going into this. So it certainly is, a, is an easy story to tell, assuming behind the scenes we're making it work operationally and financially. Yeah, yeah what's into, not to like about almonds? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then, but then when it comes to this, our, our position of this is, is simple. Um, we, we would like to invest more in agriculture. Um, we would like to have an opportunity to be providing finance to this, but at the end of the day, it is up to the growers to decide. If okay. they don't want I should to do give it, John the quick right of reply on that. 
No, that's exactly right. It is for the growers to decide, and that's certainly um, the, the view from our perspective as well, Australian yeah. Grains Champion, that uh, at the end of the day, the growers are the ones who will be the best place to work out whether this is um, appropriate for them or not. Okay. Can I make a point there, yes. uh, Tiki, in yes. relation to social licence to operate? Because, yes. you know, in this role over the last two years, probably the greatest learning I've perceived is the importance of social licence to operate, getting the growers on side and putting, putting aside the fact whether you're on the front page of the media or not, I think in regional communities that's a key critical success factor and um, you can have all the financial terms right, you can have all the legal terms right, if you don't have that social licence to operate, I don't think you have a sustainable agribusiness in Australia and, and the case study that I use, I think of an organisation that's come from outside and um, is undertaking a very major economic development project in the north is Shanghai Zhongfu in the Ord, yeah. who I think have undertaken a an outstanding program of engaging the local community, including the Indigenous community, yeah. in everything that they're trying to do in the Ord. Yeah, you're quite optimistic about the North, aren't you? I mean, that, that to me is, is higher risk territory, is it not? Yeah, yes, and it's, it's not for everybody. Yes, I'm, I'm quietly optimistic, not, under, not underestimating the challenges, which are numerous, uh, particularly in relation to infrastructure and, and labour and the like. Um, but I know I'm, I'm quietly optimistic uh, because I think there are opportunities in, in irrigated cropping on a mosaic basis. Uh, and then you look at um, some of the processing that is going in up there and there are some prospective projects for processing in the north, yeah. which opens up other income streams for uh, well, cattle whereas producers. Whereas presumably, Damon, that, that would be a space that you might leave for others to start with? Northern Australia? Yeah. Or uh, yeah, look, I mean, I think when we engaged with the federal government when they were doing some sounding, um, it sounds very interesting, but I think it probably needs a bit more bit more maturation from okay. us. Yeah. I'll hop back to David for a moment, because I just want to um, continue on this, um, this idea of um, public influence and political interference, if you like, in, uh, in, in the investment story, and particularly as regards foreign investment. Um, you know, we had the Port of Darwin decision that seemed to affect um, a, a, a Chinese investment decision. I uh, don't think it was agriculture. We've had, we've had uh, Van Diemen uh, and we've got Kidman in play. Um, how do you think uh, this should be handled? Can it be handled better? I'm not going to make an observation or comment on the policy settings or, you know, um, cases which are under advisement, basically, where the Treasurer is, um, is in the process of making decisions. Um, I suppose my remark would be, I think if you step back and do a global analysis of where we're at on foreign investment in this sector, we're, we're not as bad as we often think we are. We're very good at focusing on the 0.2%. I would actually flip it and say, and in my role personally, I focus on what I can influence and what I can control and what I, the, the good I can do, you know, in the time that I've got available. And, and that is the 99.8% of good investment work as well as um, working with Australian investors to get an investor ready. Yep. So I, I just, I leave you with this. So the Committee for Foreign Investment in the US, which is the US body somewhat akin to FERB, it is undergoing exactly the same sorts of um, dynamics at the moment in the US in relation to Chinese investment. And, um, you know, the only... Uh, and that's a process which actually allows the president to disallow a, a potential project. The only presidential disallowance um, under that process in the last five years was a Chinese party buying, proposing to buy a wind farm. So why was that disallowed? Well, it happened to be close to a military base. So, sound familiar? So, you know, everybody, every nation is grappling with these sorts of issues, um, and I think we're doing as right. well as could right. be expected. Can, can, I, can I ask perhaps then both uh, Damien and Liz, how do you see the sort of competitive tender situation uh, when you're looking at a, a big uh, agricultural asset uh, in play um, and you've got uh, sovereign owned funds who may have very different strategies, very different objectives that, that affect what hurdle rates that they, they have, um, and, and it's almost impossible to compete in terms of the uh, absolute amount that you're prepared to offer up front. 
Liz. In, in my experience in the, in the um, tender processes and public auction processes we've been involved with, um, I think it is still, back to John's earlier comment, it is still pretty rare that that gap is as wide as we may see in other asset classes, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I still think, I, I agree with John, I, I still think we're still seeing um, strong evidence of some economic rationalism. It's not to say there aren't some wild prices being paid for assets from time to time, but look, that's a, that's a competitive marketplace. But I think you know, there is no question there are, you know, there's a variation um, across the board in terms of the cost of capital, um, and that obviously flows through into purchase price. That's a a competitive marketplace. I don't, you know, for me that's that's quite apart from the FERB discussion, which you know I think is is an interesting one to have. I think our so you you happy with the new thresholds, the two fifty thre million yeah, thresholds? Yeah, I, I think from from our perspective, I my experience with international investors is they they expect a degree of scrutiny if they are seeking to buy. Farmland. Well, I mean, um, arguably, you know, the thresholds are actually much, um, much easier for them than other parts of the world. I would imagine New Zealand, and it, Canada. Exactly. And it's it's and it, you know it was very difficult. It was virtually impossible for FERB and the government under the old regime to to achieve transparency around farmland transactions. So reducing the threshold, understand, appreciate, and I struggle, you know, I, I would struggle to think of any investor who would have an issue with, with that. I think the pragmatism we've seen in terms of the implementation of the register um, has been, actually, it's been very sound. Um, you know, we've seen an extension of deadlines for those struggling to get um, the right information to the ATO in time, and just some, you know, general degree of understanding around, you know, the usual bumps and grinds of, of implementing a new process. I would, however, say that, you know, there is some caution around process efficiency. Um, you know, for, but they're doing their best under, you know, significant volume. But, you know, for me, around this level playing field question, yes. the extent to which there are unnecessarily, unnecessary delays um, may inadvertently lead to um, some disruption in the fairness of the um, of the auction system in particular, and, and what about the cost of the system? And, and look, the cost is 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 obviously of concern to us. So, you know, I think you know when we the, well, these fees fees, I think we need to be careful about how how we think about fees. So, you know, by way of comparison, if a foreigner were to come into Australia and seek to buy a business um, with a you know check size of a billion dollars, they'd pay the same fee as a foreign investor would pay to come in and buy a $10 million farm. Yeah. So for me, then I start to say, have we got a relativity issue around fees that is just a, a detractor um, from investing in a sector that requires further investment? So I, I, yeah. I think it's a, you know, there's a, there's a, there is some tension around that element um, the admi and the administrative elements of the system, but overall, um, you know, I see the rationale and the logic um, behind the policy move. John, do you agree with that? Yes, I, I certainly do agree with that. Um, the, the, having the threshold of $15 million in a global context, as was raised earlier uh, by uh, the PPM, you know, we don't have unduly um, restrictive practices around foreigners investing in Australia. The $15 million is just, it's, yes, it's a lower hurdle. Yes, it means that the market's got to change its dynamic around how they might actually sell properties. So, for example, if you're looking to sell a property and you think there might be foreign interest, you won't go to auction because a foreigner can't do an unconditional contract. Um, so, you know, it's just some market dynamic issues that have to change with it, but it's just another part of the process. Fees are obviously a problem because it does create a disincentive um, for, for foreigners to buy. But flip side, I guess if you're a foreigner looking to invest in, in global farmland, um, Australia is certainly one of the more attractive places for you to do that. Uh, if at the end of the day, if that's the fee you've got to pay, I guess some of them sort of gulp and just grin and bear it. And I guess that's where the government has uh, come from in, that, uh, in seeing that fee rate. Okay, David, the, the other regulator, of course, in terms of um, the, the domestic market is the ACCC, and we see our first agricultural commissioner, uh, Mick Keogh, who I think is, is attending the conference. Uh, now, do, do you think this is likely to change any um, of the way um, the markets are seen in Australia and uh, help or hinder investment? From investors? Mm. 
Um, time will tell. I, I, I can't predict one way or the other. Um, I don't think from an investment investor perspective, who are, who are the people I mainly work with, um, they will think of that appointment as either a necessarily a positive or a negative. You know, I, the appointment's in place. It, it, it's great, but I don't think I certainly don't think it'll be regarded as as any concern um, from an investor at all. Okay, uh, can I move on? Um, and in about in a few minutes, we'll, we'll throw to the floor. But can I move on and ask the panel about supply chains uh, and the importance of um, supply chains in terms of this um, goal of providing value-added product, uh, particularly up to Asia. Um, where, David, are the opportunities in supply chains? I, uh, I think the opportunity is in capturing value through integrating those supply chains, um, uh, particularly into Asia. Um, and I think there have been some great studies, or well, there are some great case studies of, of deals that have been done uh, along those lines. Um, so one example is the Fonterra being made uh, deal um, where there's local production um, uh, with a joint venture with a an off taker who is then providing distribution into a foreign market. I think I think that's a really good example of integrating those two organisations' supply chains. Um, and I also happen to be a great advocate for joint ventures. I think that is a is a real way to go when it comes to not only capturing that value along the supply chain but also. Um, investing in this sector in Australia. And, and Damien, for example, would you consider uh, joint venturing in some sort of structure with uh, a, a, an international investor, a foreign investor, uh, going forward in agribusiness? Yeah, yeah, look, we would. I'd say in our development, it's probably a bit over the horizon. So again, back to sort of the, the crawl, walk, run approach. <clears throat> We've had a look at one, one opportunity around, around, um, around beef, and that was um, ultimately taken up by a Chinese uh, distributor. Um, but we had a look at it. Was this in meat processing? Or yeah, in... yeah, the whole thing. Yeah, so from from paddock to, to, to plate. Um, so so we've had a look at a few things. It's it's not high on our radar at the moment, though. All right, all right. Did you did, did you find yourself recoiling and looking at the meat processing industry in a world of pain and thinking, oh, you know, why would we ever go there? No. Yeah. So that's <laughs> yeah. No, because I mean, I, I, I'm looking at again at cycles and um, and uh, and how maybe um, uh, a country like China or even Qatar sees the meat, the beef industry in this in this country, John. I think just um, just, yeah, that. So I think just, yeah. just, just, just quickly. So look, I, I think the way we think about it is is is, is back to sort of uh, Liz's point is what do we know at First Aid Super? Well, we know, we know how to do invest in financial instruments. That's one thing we know. So we'll partner with people who know, um, hopefully, the value chain opportunity and who know agriculture. Um, but what we're trying to do is when we go into infrastructure and real estate, because they're deeper, more liquid markets, we're often better able to allocate risks to certain counterparties. So when we look at that with the meat thing, we, we wouldn't be, you know, we, that would make sure that was with an aligned uh, operator who could handle that as well as possible. Mm. Mm. Supply chain is an interesting one because I think the big thematic that's coming through in relation to the agricultural sector is traceability. And the only way you can actually deliver traceability is to have some controlled supply chain. An interesting transaction that um, uh, I've been working with a couple of parties on and off in the last uh, 12 months was uh, on the cotton sector where the, the key issue was a company up in Asia that was the a uh, manufacturer for, um, for clothing products for some very major global brands, very household name brands. Um, they were see the brands were seeking uh, to ensure the sustainability of the supply source for the cotton. So they wanted to make sure that the cotton was coming from uh, agriculturally sustainable production. Uh, and not production that was um, uh, environmentally, environmentally, sorry, environmentally unsustainable. And so for them, it was actually about how do we invest back into cotton production um, so we can literally say to our customer that we can guarantee you not only where this, this cotton came from, but right down to the actual paddock and what applications of chemicals were on that paddock, et cetera, et cetera. And they're prepared to pay a premium for that. Um, and we're seeing that in other markets. So we're seeing that in grains, we're seeing that in, in meat. 
Um, these are the things, I think, um, from a supply chain perspective, that there is the ability to create additional levels of value capture. And so how you start to put those elements together, I think, is one of the interesting opportunities moving forward for Australia, um, and also how we then integrate Australian investment and foreign investment um, from paddock to plate. Mm. But if, for example, I mean, just taking the beef industry, <clears throat> if you look at it from, say, Barnaby Joyce's point of view, um, you've got this protein demand to our north, uh, you've got a very, very strong live export market. You've got a meat processing uh, industry uh, really struggling. You've got the Chinese looking at developing their own meat processing markets. So before we uh, even run out of breath saying, oh, there are any wet markets up there, um, what are the chances that we're going to miss this opportunity altogether? Uh, I think you've got to look at how the, the sector is sort of evolving. So at the moment, you know, the live uh, export is sort of meeting a particular market demand and also a particular market failure. So in, in Indonesia, for example, the market failure is actually the domestic supply chain system, a refrigerated domestic supply chain system. So a lot of that live export is actually going into local abattoirs in, in areas which don't have that. Um, that is evolving, and as it's evolving, um, of course, the type of cattle that we're putting in there is actually of a generally um, a lower quality uh, animal to say your black Angus. You're not live exporting black Angus. But, but could consumer. we end up live exporting black Angus from the south to China? No, to I, their think what you'll find, I think what you'll find is that as it, it evolves, that the, the higher end value um, consumer will want their black Angus, and I want that actually uh, from Australia, processed in Australia, so that they have got absolute clarity as around where it's sourced from and that there's no contamination issue. So it hasn't gone to a Chinese abattoir and potentially been washed with contaminated water, for example. Um, and that uh, at the live export end, you're sort of meeting a different market demand at the moment. But that market demand over time will evolve. So I think we just got to be careful here about horses for courses. Um, in terms of um, you know, the uh, processing opportunities versus the live export. I don't think one's going to dominate the other. Mm -hmm. They're both discrete, and, and we've got opportunities in both markets at the moment. But um, I think over time, live export will evolve more to a processed product. So, so presumably, David, uh, one of the big challenges is to get that clean, green, value-add branding idea into the Chinese market in the way that uh, maybe like a Murray Goulburn has been able to do um, to some degree already. Yeah, uh, and in milk. there's not much more I can add to what John said. I, I agree with everything everything he said. And um, I think there are some good case studies of, of companies like AACO. I like the way that they've transitioned from being a beef producer, strategically beef producer to, you know, a fully integrated, you know, branded beef company. Um, uh, selling their product offshore. I, I think that's a really, really good story. All right, can I ask if anybody would like to uh, come and ask a question now? Anyone up there? Please feel free, any subject around I investment in agriculture. It's hugely broad now. Yes, sir. Hello, great uh, panel discussion. Thanks so much. A question, Damien, for yourself. Tiki, it really relates to the radiata pine just behind your left shoulder there. Uh, my name's Ross Hampton. I'm the Chief Executive of the Australian Forest Products Association. Yep. One of the amazing things that's happened in, in the sector in the last 10 years has been a, a real influx of overseas money, foreign investment, and it's largely gone unnoticed, but it's meant that we've been able to re-gear the whole sector, five odd billion over the last few years. And if folks were here from those big North American superannuation funds, largely they'd tell you that they're making fortunes. And, uh, and yet, you know, there's, and it also, I should say, means we're looking very much at a, a, a growing agriculture and farming and joining together smaller uh, widespread mosaics of forestry to grow our state in Australia using farms and gaining the ecosystem services payments and the carbon payments. But Damien, the, the, the question is, why aren't Australian super funds participating? This was the Minister's comment, I think, this morning as well. So five odd billions come in the last 10 years. David Brand from New Forest says there's another 100 billion just waiting for us to free up more assets around the world. But we, we see no action from Australian super funds. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, the, there has been some investment in, in, in local timber. Um, 
So look, I, I can't comment on what some other peers have done. I, I understand some of my peers have invested in timber. We haven't yet, but we're certainly looking at them. There's a number of things we're looking at and considering. Um, time will tell whether we make those investments. Um, so taking it back to my previous comment, I, I think really there is a case here um, for stages of development. Now we've had, I know particularly a lot of the, the Danish and Dutch pension funds, some of the North American funds, have reached a scale and a critical mass to self-assess these things and have been more proactive than we have. Um, now that we've reached a certain scale, I, I hope to be there and investing in these sorts of things. Um, so I think it's really now just, a, just a, a matter of time. I, I would also say, though, again, to the point there that um, I don't, I'm not familiar with your, your product, your structure, um, but a, a number of the structures and investment vehicles that have been offered, offered um, to us haven't necessarily been that fit for purpose. So well, I think well, it's, it's are, a stage of development. What are the best structures for, um, f for super funds or for your super fund? And in particular, is there a minimum um, amount that you would be, it's quite large amounts you're talking about in terms of investing, aren't they? Yeah, it, it is. Uh, look, I think it's, it's a good, again, to build on Liz's point, I think it depends. So, so look, we haven't gone into any closed-end funds to invest in agriculture in Australia. So if we've invested, we've invested uh, in via a separate account or in our own trust, in our own vehicle with our own name on it and, and everything's set up our own way with the documents that we, we've diligenced and with our own exit and liquidity rights attached to it. Um, for smaller investors, a, a pooled fund might make perfect sense. The, the key but you'd want to lay out, what, a couple of hundred million or something? Correct, so. correct. So, so for an individual investment, for us to actually be able to allocate the resources, given our finite resources, ideally 100 to $200 million. And do you have a specific return you require? Look, it, it, it depends. We, we obviously have a minimum rate of return, which typically is a margin above inflation, but that's not that hard to beat. I think it's more around what is the appropriate return for the relative risk. At the moment, we're looking at the lower risk spectrum, more around sort of sale and lease backs. Um, in time, we'll, we'll probably look to do equity. All right. Another question. Yes, yes sir. Richard Heath from the Australian Farm Institute. Um, my question is to Liz uh, initially, but uh, the rest of the panel might want to have a go at it too. Liz, you mentioned briefly uh, the need to have uh, more nimble product offerings in terms of um, business structures. Um, I'd like you to sort of try and forecast in 10 years' time um, if the sector does manage to come up with these more nimble product offerings what you think the balance of investment will be, whether attitudes will have changed and we have been better at attracting patient capital or whether you know, we've got these other product offerings and we're getting used to seeing capital cycling in and out of ag, um, you know, what, what that balance will be. Look, it's hard, it's hard to prescribe sort of what's the right number, what does success look like, but you use some language I think that is, is particularly useful and, and I use it myself, and that is that you know, we should be looking and comfortable cycling capital in and out of agriculture and agricultural investments. And that's, you know, that's new language for those of us who grew up on family farms and the farm either stayed in the family or it left the family. And, and now we have to get much more comfortable with a, a, a new environment in which we focus firstly on um, developing long term, a long term business focus, sustainable agribusinesses that can stand the test of time almost irrespective of the capital cycling in and out. We have to give the capital a reason to cycle in and out. But if our overwhelming drive is to develop sustainable agribusinesses then with proven track records, then logic would then flow that the capital will see those opportunities as attractive. So now typically they're a bit larger, to Damien's point. We need to, we need to acknowledge that, particularly if we're trying to att attract superannuation and endowment um, fund capital, putting small checks to work is tremendously inefficient and really just not practical for their business models. So once again, it's about us understanding their business model and readjusting our product focus. So I hear a lot of frustration in the sector when you know, owner operators in particular say, look, I've got this great business plan, but I only need a couple of million. And, and it's, you know, the, you know, not criticising the business plan or the objective or the operator, but putting yourself in an institution's shoes, it's very difficult um, to find ways to play in that space. So I think some of our challenges are to find a marriage of the small and big opportunities in a, in a creative way. Um, once again, 
back to David's point around not jeopardising the sort of the social licence factor around our obligation to community, to environment and to country. So I think there's, yeah, there's some complicated business models, but I think also we can be flexible here. We so need it sounds to like there's a business, business model out there ready to develop. Yeah. <laughs> um, but can I pick up, just to add to that, uh, Karen Schneider uh, said, I thought it was very interesting, that um, we don't expect uh, corporates to uh, transform the family farm model, but go beyond 20% any time soon in Australia, she said. I was very surprised at that. Do you agree with her? I mean, let's, let's just look at the landscape. The family farmer is still overwhelmingly the predominant player in agriculture in Australia. But do you think it's going to stay like that? And, and in the foreseeable future, at the rate we're all deploying capital, it is very difficult to see an environment where the family farmer becomes in any way dwarfed by, you know, in inverted commas, the corporate farmer. But, but I'd go further than that and say, does it matter? Does it matter if we've got successful farming businesses being developed, employing people, committing themselves to local communities, you know, generating all the sort of social licence that we all desire in order to operate? I don't see the two models as being mutually exclusive. I think the market is well and truly large enough for both. I can just add to that. So the interesting thing in Western Australia is, um, for example, uh, 15 years ago there was 10,000 um, grain growers growing on average about 9 million tonnes. Today we have roughly around 4,000 growers growing 12 and a half million tonnes. What's happening is the family farmer business is getting bigger. They're getting bigger, more sophisticated, and as they're developing, they have more access to internally generated um, capital that they can actually sustain uh, investment in their business, and so therefore a cycle. So the family farm itself, as a model, will very much remain the mainstay, but they are getting more and more like a business in the way that they run. Okay. And, and Tiki, I actually didn't fully answer. The gentleman uh, had the question about the radiator pine and local timber. So Sorry. do you mind if I go yes, back to that? Please, yes. Because um, it, it's a good question. And, and I think, if anything, uh, having thought about it a little bit further, some of my peers actually do tend to invest more in offshore timber than local. And, and there is one reason. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. Uh, just one, one, one reason that has sometimes been given and we've thought about a little bit is that if you look at our members' balance sheet, it's, it's two things, really, when they approach retirement. It's their house. Uh, which I sh mostly own outright as they're approaching retirement and their superannuation. Um, and typically the house is bigger than the super, uh, depending on where you live. Um, and so we're very sensitive to, to investments that have a correlation to residential house prices. Um, and sometimes, sometimes, depending on the nature of the, the timber production, it can be sensitive to the housing cycle. And so it tends to be if our members got, uh, you know, their house prices have been challenged, it's because the, the timber prices have been challenged as well. So we, that's sometimes a reason we do think about things and, and what can be diversifying from our overall exposure, combined with the fact that as a, an investor in Australian shares, that tends to mean we own a lot of the Australian local banks. Mm -hmm. So banks, houses, it means sometimes we're a bit, bit wary of, 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 of local uh, radiata. Okay. Actually, yes, yes. A, uh, and that just makes me ask, um, We've talked a lot about rates of return from a superannuation fund perspective, but it makes me think, you know, how important is preservation of capital as part of your investment um, thesis, as well as having a diversified portfolio which is not correlated to public markets? Yeah, critical. Uh, and that's absolutely critical. So, so our, our benchmark uh, for our broad funds, um, so we have about $55 billion, um, about the biggest fund we have most of them are in our, our diversified fund, which has a, a CPI plus hurdle rate. So. It's, it's very absolute return. Um, Equally, there'd be many, many agricultural assets who would be a long way from any, anything to do with the housing market, which I heard on the drive up here yeah. actually is, is bigger than the mining, mining industry now, real estate. And I'm going to get to that. So I think that, that, that that's timber, right? Mm. Um, done. So, so, so uh, then broader agriculture is actually, in the main, very diversifying to our broader exposures. Um, and I'll give the example of our sale and lease back of those three plantations in New South Wales, Vic and South Australia. What happens there to impact those returns has nothing to do with what's happening on Wall Street. It's very much what's happening to do on, on how, that, um, how that operator is growing those, those almond trees and how it's been watered and whether the bees are, you know, it's very localised, it's terrific, it's exactly what we want. Mm. Okay. Uh, any more questions for a moment? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Tiki, yes. over here. 
<laughs> Sorry, I've lost you. Lady in blue. Oh, Lady in blue. Okay. Oh, okay. do apologise. Yes. That's all right. It's fine. Thank you. Uh, my name is Robin Clough. I'm a farmer and a company director in the agribusiness sector. My question is to the panel generally and perhaps to David specifically. Um, it's interesting that a number of countries' sovereign funds invest in Australia because they see it as a great investment opportunity in the long term. And yet Australia has its own sovereign fund, and it's called the Future Fund, and it has nearly $120 billion in it. And it has it in, in its investment policy mandate that it can invest in agriculture, and yet the investment in agriculture to date is less than 1%, so it's lost in the rounding. Um, to me, there's a great opportunity, and I'd like to know what your various panel members think about partnering with the Australian Future Fund, and by leadership, that fund, perhaps now with our new Deputy Prime Minister, can lead the way, but um, there's a great joint venturing and partnership, or partnership opportunity there. Great question, Robin. Yes, David. Uh, again, maybe Damien can, um, or the others can give a more insightful answer, but um, all I can say from, from the investors I work with, there, there is an enormous amount of appetite from um, overseas equivalents of the future fund, um, you know, overseas sovereign wealth funds to invest in the in the sector in Australia. Um, so they are constantly uh, looking at investing here. Uh, as to the future fund itself, you know, I, I really don't know what their um, what their investment theme really is in agriculture or their their approach to it. All I know is I. I think they've got 16% allocated towards what's called infrastructure and timber, but I don't know how much of their, that's of their total fund, I don't know how much of that actually comprises agriculture, and you've quoted that very, very small number within that 16%, but I'll hand over more to the experts. Look, and we, we, so we, we work with the Future Fund very regularly, um, as, as we all do from time to time, and then we, we might compete in the, in the next week. Um, but they have a very particular mandate, and I, and I can't speak for them, and I wouldn't speak for them. I don't know if that 1% is accurate or not. I do know they're very large investors in, in timber, both locally and offshore, um, they don't have the same mandate that we do. You know, they don't have, you know, this, this is for the federal government, this isn't for, you know, the average member with a house on, on the balance sheet. So, so they're far more open to, to timber locally and offshore. Um, they are looking at, at agriculture. Um, they're looking at it and, and we talk to them regularly about opportunities. What, what's to stop them well, finish looking and well, actually they, they've actually, doing. They've actually got a very heightened sensitivity. So I think we, this is something we all need to be to be to be front but, and centre. But of. Is it, does it come down to oh well, we all know who the CIOs are all over the place, and actually, you know, if they step out there and uh, hop into um, dairy or wherever, and the whole thing falls flat, then it'll be that chap or that woman who who will be accountable. Is this is this because nobody really wants to go off the edge? Because, because we've been out of agriculture investment for so long? No, no, I, I think it's more the case of um, the Future Fund, like us and like other, other large funds, we have a wealth of things we can invest into. And agriculture has to stack up versus other opportunities we can do in, in, in liquid asset classes and other real assets such as real estate and infrastructure. Um, it has to stack up on the returns, it has to stack up on the liquidity, it has to stack up you know, a range of things. So I think it, it is getting better. But to my point, I, I think that I think that the, the, the debate in 10 years' time is going to be completely different. I, I really believe agriculture is starting to be an asset class of its own. It hasn't been in the past. Um, to, the, to the Future Fund, and again, I don't want to put words in their mouth because they, they run their own. They run a very, 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 very good uh, approach. Is that It is a federal government agency. It needs to be very careful on what it, it puts its weight behind. Mm. And, but, and there are a number of initiatives here that we're talking about that are topical, uh, and so they need to be very careful. All right. Does anybody else like to comment on the, the future fund? I mean, if it is very much um, a, a, a government thing, taxpayers' money all, all, all in there, um, then isn't this something, dare I say, picking winners? But given that agriculture is one of the planks to transition this economy, isn't this something that should encourage the future fund to go for it? I think the, the overriding question on this is that the Future Fund, like some of the other funds, which are very large, 
So the future fund's over $100 billion. It probably has to reinvest roughly $20 billion a year, I guess. Um, how do we as a sector package up um, investment transactions of a size that's going to actually be material for the future fund? They are not going to be interested in five, 10, 15, $20 million deals. Indeed, they're not going to be interested in anything under maybe $100, $200 million. So how do we as a sector start to present opportunities that make sense to them. But, but why wouldn't they be interested in, you know, a good chunk of the Kidman property, for example? I don't know if they did or didn't have a look at it, but I, I guess I'm just making sort of the overriding that they need to see transaction flow that they can actually look at, compare against other asset classes, um, but are, are of a size that they can actually spend the time to do the analysis to make the investment decision. Yeah. And that's our challenge as a sector. I think it's fair to say, <clears throat> Tiki, there is a huge investment in time we're seeing and experiencing from the Aussie Supers and the Future Fund in understanding the sector, yeah. in unpacking it and ensuring that they understand the relative risk reward equation. Um, and and that's, that's quite understandable before they, you know, before they dive in. They've all got um, you know, their respective fiduciary accountabilities. They can't just make a bet. So I think mm. you know, part of it is, I, you know, I, I know there's a frustration because it looks like a relatively straightforward solution, but there is a, there, there's a logical process that needs to be undertaken to ensure the education's right, to ensure the deals stack up, mm. the proposition's right. And so it's really incumbent upon the sector as much as it is upon you know, my friends in the superannuation industry to really collaborate on you know, quite a meaningful education um, process. Mm. I guess the, um, the frustration comes from the fact that you know, there's certainly a public perception that other foreign investors can see long-term value in Australian agriculture. Um, our own superannuation industry is looking at long-term investments to secure the future of their members, and there seems to be some sort of bit of a mismatch. Mismatch yeah. Yeah. Uh, in in why the two can't get together. Yeah, and I think to Damien's point, many of the offshore investors we deal with have been exploring this space for a much longer period of time. Um, often their investment drivers and mandates are slightly different, mm. or they're actually seeing the Aussie agri space as a tremendous defensive diversification play. Whereas if it's in your own backyard, you look at it naturally through a different investment lens. So, you know, I think you know, we need them all. Mm. <laughs> we don't want to alienate one or the other. We need them all. But I think they're just, Damien, I think they're just at a different stage in yeah, many of them at a different stage in the journey, and quite frankly, many of them at the same stage. Yeah, look, it's a very legitimate question. It is absolutely appropriate, and and but I just think it is very hard to do it. You know, well, they're here, why aren't why aren't us? Why aren't, us, why aren't we? Um, and I think we've really covered a lot of the, the, the points. Uh, but, but ultimately, you know, there are strategic investors from offshore and they have a completely different mandate. Mm -hmm. There are financial investors from offshore and as I've said, the Europeans and the Canadians and, 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 uh, have been active here for decades. Mm -hmm. um, they had hundreds of billions of dollars 10, 15 years ago. You know, they had large, massive investment teams. They knew the value of it and they've done the work and they've come out and they've invested. Um, so, so did our super industry 15, 20 years ago. No, they had no, a bit of interest in agriculture. Culture. Yeah, yeah, and, and those, those that have made early investments have been very, very poorly rewarded and the trustees are very loath to go back in. All right. Uh, yes, gentleman up the top there, was there? Just oh, up here. here. Right. Yes, sir. Um, about 10 years ago, Bill Hurditch is my name from the Fifth Estate in Sydney. About 10 years ago, the Australian Government introduced a range of water reforms and that sort of tended to stimulate a lot more industrial agricultural farming. My question to the panel is, what are, the, are there, the panel's sort of top three remaining reforms or levers that government has at their disposal, other than raiding the, super fund, uh, the, uh, the future fund, um, to encourage greater investment? I mean, California is currently ripping out almond trees because they haven't got any water. They would love to have water reform like we've had, but what are the other levers that are at the government's disposal? Damien, can I start with you? Because you actually mentioned to me how that particular water reform really made you a lot more comfortable. 
Yeah, yeah look, I, I actually, I'd love to hear what the other panels have to say because I'm sort of bereft of ideas of, of policy reform to do next. I'm sure they'll have better ideas. Um, but in terms of our experience with water, again, it was a, it was a topical topic uh, for our trustees. But, you know, we spent a lot of time with, with some of our operating partners um, to, to understand the space. And you know our, our view is that our, our 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 water trading market. There's a range of opinions, but it it is hard fought and won, and that it is the envy of some of, of a number of groups, such as the Californians. There's a range of opinions on it, of course, still. Um, but that you know it is a market now, which is which is functioning, which has allowed us to come in and and offer offer sale and leasebacks for for farmers, typically family farmers that want to free up some some capital off their balance sheets to reinvest in the in their in their farm. All right. Well, David, can I ask you for your thoughts on the reform front? I don't have any silver bullets or magic bullets, I must no, say. No, neither does the Prime Minister. So uh, I might pass to some of my colleagues. Yes. In? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, look, I think um, you know, water is a great example, and you know, I would concur with Damien, has, is a definite competitive advantage when I'm offshore. Um, and I'm talking to investors about um, dealing with climate change uh, and dealing with climate risk. Our water regime is, is without question a positive, particularly uh, relative to our friends in California. I think the other area of, um, of policy and, and so government intervention that we can't overlook is, is really the tremendous advances in trade policy and trade relations we've seen, particularly over the last 12 to 18 months. Um, <clears throat> just opening the door, even optically, um, to the world further um, in a more competitive landscape um, is a tremendously positive story and creates a, a positive outlook. So I, I do think it's been more than water. I think water and trade are really important. Then I think you can dive down into particular um, subsectors or geographic areas and, you know, we could get into the weeds here, which we love to do um, in agriculture, but, you know, David and I have had long discussions about land tenure reform in the north as, as being, you know, a, a, a priority possibly required for really significant um, development in the north to eventuate, particularly in farmland conversion. So, Tiki, I think you then break it down into sort of sector-specific um, objectives. But but I'd step back from that and, and as an industry I'd challenge us not to necessarily look to the government um, and look to policy um, to, to drive our sector. But you know I would come back, we've talked a lot over the last hour about the investor perspective, bringing capital in, but, but there is still a bottom-up imperative um, on farm within our operations to focus on productivity. And you know, ultimately, um, strong agribusinesses with a strong productivity agenda, willing to embrace technology, um, embrace new genetics, embrace R&D, will, will, by virtue of their success, if they do all of that prudently, will attract capital. And it'll either be fresh capital from fresh equity, or they'll be able to tap the debt market more effectively than they have been in the past. So, I think there's not, to David's point, there's not a silver bullet out here. There are a lot of factors, but at the end of the day, if we lose focus on running really strong underlying operations mm. with a strong business strategy, a strong view around trade flow and supply chains, if we lose sight of all of that because there's some interesting dialogue um, around the macro, mm. I think we're perhaps missing um, the greatest opportunity. All right. Well, all. we're going to drill down on it, on that stuff after lunch, I think, um, in one of the sessions. But um, John, what, what's your view? Or do you, do you have a view, for example, on, uh, as I was saying, the the, the Triple C and markets and whether companies should be allowed to uh, get bigger? Well, I think we have already operate in a very deregulated environment in agriculture anyway. A lot of the, um, the reforms have occurred in the last 20 years with um, you know, what we've seen in the, uh, the grains industry and, and the like. And the, I think I agree with exactly what Liz was saying. It's actually more the focus um, has also got to be on, on the productivity side of it. And um, we've got some fantastic examples out there. And we've got sectors which are very much laggards. I mean, I have had a huge amount to do with the cotton industry in my career. and. Uh, I keep looking at that and thinking how wonderful these guys are reinventing themselves um, decade after decade. You know, they've grown productivity there and just in terms of farm productivity by a compound 3.3% per annum now for 25 years straight. There's not another ag sector out there that you can really point to that's 
developed itself to that level of embracing technology, embracing change, and constantly innovating itself. They're the sorts of things that um, I think that have to be encouraged. Um, and so from that perspective, I think that the, the only area I would be really arguing that we need to have a good look at is how we are structured now and moving forward in terms of our investment in R&D, our investment in skills. Um, we've seen the sort of dissolving of the uh, rural aid colleges over time, um, a, a sort of a de-investment in skill bases. Um, I was talking to, uh, to uh, the, the person from Melbourne University though before and they were saying that they've had encouragingly a sevenfold increase in, um, in applications into their uh, Bachelor of um, Agriculture course in the last sort of 10 years. So maybe we are starting to see a reversal of that um, and uh, rebuilding of skill bases in the sector, which I think is vitally important. Right, one up there, I think. Thanks, Tiki, and great Thank panel. Uh, Georgie Somerset, a beef producer and director on various boards. Um, really interested to hear about the productivity, and I'm just interested John and Liz, whether you could just give us a little bit more of a perspective on how you see that investment in productivity. We heard earlier from Karen that that's where the next, I guess, benefit and return on investment is going to come. Um, but also, is there potential there for more public-private partnerships between people like yourselves, um, potentially around things like telecommunications infrastructure and things that might enable us to take advantage of the digital age? Um, or whether there are other models for investment. So you talk about having investor-ready models. We've only talked about, you've only really talked about two today, the owner-operator or the um, buy and lease back. Are there other models that you see as being effective that will help drive the productivity in some sort of joint venture capacity or public-private? Yeah, um, in, in our, you know, I can only speak for the productivity agendas in our um, couple of businesses. So obviously we've got a large livestock business operating um, across eastern Australia and then a large um, grains portfolio in the west and the east. And look, you know, technology is, um, you know, is obviously you know, a big category um, or a big label, but um, we're very excited about the impact technology has had on both of those businesses uh, in terms of not only um, you know, the productivity agenda, but addressing the traceability um, imperative and product um, safety and security. Um, so are we doing more with less? Um, absolutely. Um, are we doing it um, in a more prudent way, particularly with respect to water utilisation? Absolutely. And are we chipping away um, you know, at those one percenters, which is really what the industry is all about, at those one percenters in terms of productivity gains uh, in both businesses, um, you know, the answer, uh, the answer is yes. In terms of, you know, what are the obstacles to, to more of that, um, you know, obviously, once again, we circle back to the availability of capital. You know, to deploy state-of-the-art um, technology uh, and equipment right across a, you know, 80 thousand hectare cropping portfolio obviously requires a significant um, a significant upfront uh, investment to reconfigure farms uh, and apply the machinery and the technology in the way that we do so obviously having capital to hand is is fundamental for that now there are lots of different models for bringing the capital in that we're already seeing at play in Australia it's not simply an owner an owner operator or own in leaseback it's the way you construct and and, and collect that capital that, um, you know, that's the interesting piece. Um, are, we, are we going to see more <coughs> joint ventures, both? Uh... I think you're seeing joint ventures, you're seeing commingled funds, you're seeing, um, you know, large scale sort of investment mandates from single investors. Mm -hmm. You're seeing, you know, some really creative um, creative structures to, to embrace capital. A I and think... who's at the forefront of that, driving those? That the innovation in that space. Yeah, so there's you know, there's a combination of you know investment managers, um, mm. superannuation funds and pension funds, both Australian and overseas, and some really innovative Australian local operators, often family operators, who've built to a certain scale, have a solid capital base, a solid balance sheet. They're not in distress. They're actually set for growth. Um, and there's a real distinction there. It's not distressed as you know a replacement for debt. Um, in this situation. They're poised for growth. They have 
the right platform, um, and this is sort of the turbocharge I think someone spoke about. So I think there are models evolving in the sector. Um, there are other um, methods of um, aggregating capital. I can see others in the room who aggregate capital in a slightly different way than the way we do. So I think our challenge is to continue to evolve those models, articulate them well and simply, and prove that we all can generate a track record. Um, I think that's, the, that's probably the first imperative. In terms of the PPP model in its purest sense, applying in agriculture, I struggle a little bit um, to see how it could apply. Um, to be honest, the, you know, the PPP models I've seen I think I'd, I'd just struggle to construct it, but we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't put it outside the, the realms of, of possibility. I think everything's, everything's up for grabs, really. If I can just build on that. There are also some innovative models um, when you look at, in terms of trying to attract capital, uh, you know, Murray Goldwyn and its hybrid structure, yeah. um, where it's now raising capital from the, from the public markets. Um, Sunrise is obviously working on a, a similar sort of hybrid structure. So there is some really good innovation being done in terms of means to raise capital. And it's an interesting trend to see the increasing number of agri-related firms that are seeking listing on the ASX. There have been uh, so, so quite a number think, recently. So, so you think the sort of, um, sort of hybrid cooperative may, may find a new life? Um, in, in, in a number of different structures around the place? Because, I mean, I'm looking sure. at Murray Goulburn, it, it is a, a remarkable that it works, really. Yeah, no, I, I, I think there's, a, there's a, a, a small track there now that's been built, yeah. um, uh, and, and I'm, I'm sure other cooperatives that are looking for means by which to grow, as well as to um, access capital, will look at those sorts of hybrid structures. Mm -hmm. If I can just finish off on the productivity piece. Um, I think the other thing that, uh, from a productivity perspective, is let's not lose sight at the end of the day, the biggest component of our sector is the family farm. And the most important things for them, and the, 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 um, the person asking the question sort of touched on this, is uh, access to information. Um, a lot of our farmers, as I go around Australia, struggle with access to information, in other words, access to the internet. Um, the ability to be able to um, uh, move information um, from them to their farm advisor and back again, the ability to be able to source information freely um, and, and the like. That sort of thing, allowing our family farmers to build their skill levels, to actually have access to market information, to understand whether they, whether they should be growing um, uh, malting barley or, or feed barley and how they sort of, uh, sort of assess the sort of market implications of that. Um, to improve their operational skills, to improve their, in, indeed, just their bookkeeping skills in, in, uh, inside running the business, to understand their cost structures and how they can better manage the, their cost structures. Those sorts of things we can't lose sight of, those grassroots elements that um, uh, a lot, for a lot of people are still, they still struggle with because they, they don't have a regular, reliable connection of, um, of services to others that they need to connect in with. It's a good point, and we should take it to the next level. I think one of the, you know, the great challenges for the sector is to, to get better at gathering information and data more broadly. Yeah. Um, if we look at um, investment capital, it has a strong appetite to be able to benchmark um, and to seek um, comparable data. Um, in order to validate um, an investment thesis or a proposition. Uh, the industry still has a way to go. There's some great work being done by ABEARS and others um, in gathering bottom-up data, but you know, I, I still think we've got a long way to go to be as sophisticated as other investment classes um, to enable that capital to evaluate us more appropriately. I just have one question to, to end on. Um, and we talked, uh, the issue of water was raised. Now, um, there, there still is no clean way to invest in water. Do you think there's going to be a, a, a time where we're going to have a listed water company? I mean, we've had people like the Carl Betzers and, and other water barons, but uh, do you think that is going to come and be of interest to investors? So there is a, you know, a water trading fund um, available to investors. I, my experience with investors is there are you know, the different levels of appetite. So our investors seek exposure to water through farmland and water um, being coupled in, in a single portfolio. I think that's one approach, but you know, water is obviously a hugely valuable resource. Mm. I think we can expect it to feature in many, many product structures in the future. Absolutely. Mm. 
All right. Well, for me, this has been a, a, just a terrific plenary. I've uh, really enjoyed the input from um, all four of you, so, so, so close to all these challenges. Um, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, we'll now uh, go to lunch, but if I can just thank um, Elizabeth, John, Damien, and David very much for their time. Thank you.